All right. This is good. This is wonderful. I'm, I'm, I'm personally happy. So I'm glad y'all are here. Bless y'all. Um, we're going to start in Luke today. I know we're in John, but we're going to start in Luke. Chapter 9 of Luke. Wow, nine's a big chapter. We're going to 957. That's a lot of words. All right. And it came to pass that they, as they, and that, if, if you read the backstory, which we're not going to because we're going forward, but that's Yeshua and his crew. That's who they is. Went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And so Yeshua, what's going on in his ministry right now, is he's starting to make a mark he's, you know, on, the, on the society. And so people are starting to follow him. People are starting to know who he is. And this guy says, Master, basically, this is what he's saying. Master, I want to become one of your disciples and I want to follow you and I want to go where you go because these disciples are following him around as he's moving throughout the land, right? And they're going hither and non. And he goes, I want to go wherever you go. And so Yeshua is this, I don't, I'm not trying to undersell what he's doing at all, but he's like a fad, right? It's like it's popular. And so people want to jump into this new thing, this new guru, this new master, because there were other masters going on. They, they would pop up here and there. And I submit to you that a lot of the people following him didn't really know who he was in the beginning. And, and that's evident. Even his own apostles, you know, the 12 had, had questions about him at times. Um, and so people quickly jump on a new thing and, Yeshua, he looks at this guy who says, I want to follow you wherever you go. And he knows the guy's heart, right? He actually knows the inner guy. So look at the next verse, verse 58. And Jesus, Yeshua said unto him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Now we don't read here how this man then responded to Yeshua because he's, he's about to switch gears into some other people that are talking to him. But we can pretty much assume, assume from what's coming after that, and we're going to read what comes after that, that this guy wasn't happy with Yeshua's response. He didn't like this response that he's saying. Because when we look at it, it's just like, all right, he says, I want to follow you. And he goes, yeah, well, we don't have anywhere. I don't have anywhere to lay my head. So Yeshua is saying, sure, you can come along if you want, but we're nomads. Right? We just, we don't know where we're going. Um, there's, we have nothing solid. There's nothing stable as far as our living situation goes. We're, we're constantly on the move. And I think that this was probably an important thing to the guy he's talking to. I think he can see that what this guy wants is stability as far as a living, like we live here. And he's saying, no, you know, I don't have anywhere to live if you follow me. And if you want to follow me, I think the words that he's trying to convey to this guy are, you're going to have to accept a certain ambiguity of lifestyle or of, of life where you're living kind of thing because we have nowhere to stay. And I think that's the first teaching point of what we're doing today. And that's many people are willing to go along as long as they're not uncomfortable. Many people are willing to follow as long as they don't have to change, right? I'm willing to follow. I just don't want to have to change. Um, and many people are willing to join, um, but they're not necessarily willing to give complete trust. And I think that's what's going on with this guy because he's like, hey, I want to follow you. And he's like, yeah, okay, but uh, let me just let you know right up front, uh, we don't know where we're sleeping tomorrow. And I think that's what's coming in there. So I think we can kind of draw that from that. Now look at verse 59. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, which when we read Lord in the, in the King James New Testament, it's like master. It's like great teacher. And again, it's like the Eastern thing. I always kind of revert to the Kung Fu master kind of guy, the Shaolin master. I mean, it's like you're, gonna, you're a great teacher. Uh, masters have disciples. It's just a given. And so when they call him master, they're recognizing his position when they call him Lord like that. And he says, but he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Now, that sounds reasonable, right? 
Yeshua's walking. He sees this guy while he's walking. He goes, hey, um, come and follow me. And the guy's, yeah, let me go bury my dad first. This guy's probably en route to the funeral. Or he's received word that his dad's dead and he's thinking, all right, I got to get home and I'm the son and I've got to, you know, ensure this funeral goes on. I mean, that sounds to us, sounds to me anyway, like a reasonable request on this guy's part. And Yeshua, so he says, Yeshua says, come on and follow us. And he goes, okay, but I got to bury my dead dad first. That's like, okay. Um, but then look what Yeshua says to him. And Yeshua, verse 60, Yeshua said unto him, let the dead bury their dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Let the dead bury the dead. There's a couple things going on right there. See, I think people just read over that, but there's a couple things there. The first thing is, how can dead people bury anybody? See, Yeshua is saying, let the dead bury the dead. He's basically saying, let the spiritually dead those who are lost, let them deal with this. Let them bury this physically dead person. So he's using two deads there because obviously he's not saying, well, let the ghost come and dig a hole and throw this guy in it and bury him. He's saying, let the spiritually dead, the lost, um, bury him. Well, if you think about that, because I did, doesn't that sound like Yeshua is giving up on some people? I mean, here he is calling these people the dead. You come with me, you go proclaim the gospel of Yah, let the dead bury the dead. Let those spiritually dead lost people. And it sounds like Yeshua has given up on those people. So keep a finger here, as we're coming back to Luke, but let's go to 1 Timothy. I'll put this here. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Because we're going to do a little bit of compare and contrast here. So 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Now this is Paul writing to Timothy, right? He says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So, Offer prayers up for your leaders. Offer prayers up for everybody. We just want to live in peace and tranquility. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, which the, the verse changes, but the sentence continues, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of truth. So this is perfect in the sight of God our Savior, Yahweh, Elohim, and God our Savior wants all men to be saved. He wants all to come to the knowledge of truth. And then verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And so Yeshua says, Come and follow me. And the man says, Okay, but let me go bury my dad first. And then Jesus says unto him, Let the dead bury their dead. We're back in Luke. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And so, as we just read in Timothy, he wants all people to be saved. But check it out. He gives people free will. And he knows what, what he's calling the dead here are going to choose. Right? It's, it's like that Calvinist thing. Calvin, Calvinists... Um, aren't really into evangelizing because they're like, hey, God knows who he's calling. He's calling who he is, and there's predestination. There's nothing you can do about it, which goes right against free will. They don't really believe in free will, that we have a free will to accept Yeshua or not. You've been predestined from the beginning. He knew you when you were before you were in the womb, so he already knows. That's kind of what they think. So how, how do you balance the two, go and spread the gospel? Why bother going and spread the gospel to all the world if people who are going to get it are going to get it? Well, it, it's a... It's one of those metaphysical things. He gives us free will. He also knows what we're going to choose before we even know ourselves what we're going to choose. And so we still have free will. And so when he tells the man, you do not need to waste your time on the dead, spiritually dead. You, because that's what he's going. He's like, don't, don't worry about physically dead people. Don't be hanging out with the spiritually dead people. They can take care of that on their own. What you need to do is go focus on the kingdom of Yah. You need to go put that out. You, that's your task. Leave that other dead, spiritually dead stuff behind and preach the kingdom of Elohim. That's the real work. 
And so I think there's another teaching point there for us. And it's a delicate, it's a, it's a mildly delicate teaching point because I think people can take it out of context. But we, we do not need to cast our pearls before swine. We don't need to hang out with spiritually dead people if we discern that they're spiritually dead. It's like... Um, The man uh, in the parable of the sower, right? And he casts his seed and it falls by the wayside. I think that's the other thing that's going on here with, with Yeshua and this guy going to bury the dead. Don't go back to those dead people, those spiritually dead people, because they're going to choke you out, th this new truth that you've discovered by following me. And so that's something else we need to consider. We don't need to allow ourselves to be choked out with with spiritually dead people. I'm not saying don't hang out with sinners and publicans and don't spread the word, but I know in my life I have met people who are just not gonna get it. They're just not, and they're wicked, evil people, and it's like you're wasting your time hanging out with those people. Well, how do you know? How do you know that they're not gonna come to Yeshua? Well, you don't know, but if you exercise discernment, you can tell who you're wasting your time with and who you're not. And so I would just say we can take a lesson from that. We don't need to go cast our pearls before swine. We don't need to go back and worry about the dead when it's time to worry about preaching the kingdom of Elohim. Am I telling you not to go to your parents' funeral? I'm not. That, that, that's not what I'm saying here. This was one example of this guy. And like I said, I think another factor in that was Yeshua knew that if he went back to go to this funeral, he's going to be surrounded by all these people and that's just going to be like, yeah, I was going to follow that guy, but right now I've got to paint the, the siding on the house because dad never got around to that or something like that. Um, so if you discern that people are spiritually dead, you need to kick the dust off your feet and keep walking. I mean, that's a biblical principle too. So it's like, it, it's a balancing act. That's why I said we don't want to take that out of context. All right, so verse 61 of Luke 9. Another also said, Lord or Master, I will follow thee, but first... Let me go bid them farewell, which are at home, at home at my house. And Yeshua said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And that's actually why we're here in Luke today, was for that little bit of scripture right there. I heard a pastor one time try to refer to him being a pastor. He said he was going to stay a pastor forever until he died, because no man putting his hand to the plow looks back. That's not what this is talking about. It's not a, uh, another pastor friend of mine used to use this term, rapture ministry. It's like, Sister Queen, can you please be in charge of our children's church? And then he'd go, it's not a rapture ministry. You're not going to have to do this till Yeshua comes back. <laughs> right? It's like, just do it for a year or just do it for six months or, or that kind of thing. And, you know, I don't think pastors have to be pastors for life. That's not what this verse is talking about right here. Um, Yeshua says... You know, the guy says, hey, I'm going to follow you after I go say goodbye to my family. And then Yeshua says, once you put your hand to this plow, he's talking about himself as the plow in this case. If you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of Elohim. That's what he's talking about. Once you see me, once you see what I have to offer, if you want to go back and deal with this other mundane stuff, you're not worthy of the kingdom. And so I did a little research. Because I've done research on like the Israelite swords back in like, you know, Old Testament stuff. There's a dearth of information on that. It's not really clear. Um, and so then I did some information, uh, some searching on what kind of plow were the Israelites using at this time frame? You know, 2,000 years ago. It's like, because, you know, that's what Yeshua's talking. He's using something that people understand. And I'm thinking this guy that he's talking to is not a cobbler, is not a stonemason, is not a whatever. He's a guy that plows. That's why he's using that example. It's like, you understand what I'm talking about. And so he says, hey, anybody puts his hand to the plow. Because it says hand to the plow, not hands to the plow. See, we live in, right now we're in Kansas, right? So it's like we, you picture this big plow with a big steel thing and, and you hold it behind the horses. No, they had like a stick and it had a piece of wood because they didn't have iron plows right there. And you would hold it with one hand and it was like this thing that would dig in the ground. And then you had this little whip in the other hand. And so you would hold this thing, the 
oxen or whatever is pulling it, you're kind of saying, come on, come on, come on. And it, it kind of scratches a furrow in the ground that you then plant seeds in. And the way you would do that, because you want, oh, it scratches a narrow furrow in the ground, right? It's just a little stick going through and then, then you plant your stuff in. And the way you make it straight, see straight and narrow, there's like a whole thing there, which is, I'm getting chills because it hit me today. Um, is you look at something in the horizon, that tree, the corner of that house or whatever, and you're like, come on, let's go. Because if you're looking at the ground, you're going to do all that. And so you look at something in the horizon, just drive your cow so you have nice straight lines. And yeah, forbid you turn around and look back while you're doing that. It's going to cut across what you already plowed and everything else. And so you're not fit if you do that. This was a concept this guy understood. And that's why I think he probably was a plower, you know, kind of guy. He's probably a farmer. And so he goes, you're not fit for the kingdom after looking back. So, do y'all remember who else looked back? Yes. Yeah. Lot's wife, right? <clears throat> she looked back uh, at Sodom, and then she's turned into that pillar of salt. Um, again, Yeshua was bringing things that are deep truths that the Israelites knew. They all knew this story, right? Just like y'all knew this story. Um, but a lot of people out there don't know that story. You immediately said Lot's wife. But she looks back at Sodom, and when she does turn into that pillar of salt, overdone, unworthy. Right? Unworthy of Yah, you can't come to, to safety, if you will. Um, so once one has seen Yeshua, once one has decided to walk in his way, once one uh, experiences that, to turn one's back on that is like the height of scorn of, of Yah and, and Yeshua. You've had the, the goodness of Yeshua and you've turned your back on it. Please turn to Deuteronomy um, chapter 30. And we're going to be in verse 15, so we're going to start. You know what? 30? 30? 15. 15. Yeah. So we're going to start. See, I have set before you this day life and good, death and evil. In that I command thee this day to love Yahweh thy Elohim, the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And Yahweh thy Elohim shall bless thee in the land wherever you go to possess it. But if thy heart turn away, just like with the plow, you put your hand to the plow and you turn back, you look back, or just like Lot's wife turns back, if you turn away so that you will not hear, we're getting to hear later on today too, but shall be drawn away, shall turn back, if you will, back to where you were and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce them to you this day and ye shall surely perish. Now, do you think he means perish right there as soon as you decide to start following these gods? No, he's talking about everlasting life. We're going to get to that too. And ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whether thou passest over the Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. Why does he call heaven and earth? Witnesses. Two witnesses, right? In the mouth of two or three is a thing established, so he's calling heaven and earth. To record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your seed may live that you may love Yahweh your Elohim and that you may obey his voice, that you may as cleave unto him, for he is your life and the length of your days, that you may dwell in the land which Yahweh swear unto your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. If you turn away, if you are drawn away, if you turn back, if you're drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, bad things are coming. Once you put your hand to the plow of serving Yah, once you put your hand to the plow of following Yeshua, you can't turn around and go back. All of that was preamble for where we're going today in John chapter 5. So let's go there. It will inform our discussion of John chapter 5. All right, so... Last week, we finished up um, John 5, around 22, 23, and in John 5, 22, it says, For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son, 
that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honors not the Son honors not the Father which has sent him. And so Yeshua says, if you don't honor him, or he's saying, if, you know, Yeshua's saying, if you don't honor me, you're not honoring the Father. Now he's talking to, pe- to Abba Yahweh, right? He's talking to people who think they honor the Father, who think they're, they're following Yah, Yahweh, Adonai, right? Um, and he says, look, if you don't honor me, you're not honoring him, which is, we talked about this last week, but that just made them want to kill him. Right? This is blasphemous to their ears. That's like, you know, Brother Sven standing up saying, if you don't follow me, you're not following God. What? So, all right, we talked about that last week. It has been my unfortunate experience, and some, maybe most of y'all's experience, to know people who once followed Yeshua and then ceased doing so after having their proverbial hand to the proverbial plow if you will. Um, People who had been shown the way out of Sodom and then turned back to it after having even walked in the way and seen the the truth of it. And people who had once um, professed, confessed, testified that Yeshua was the Christ, Jesus was the Christ, and then ended up denying him after that. Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. Whosoever denies the Son, the same has not the Father. He that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. That's from 1 John 2, 22 through 23. And so we come today to the bit in John that we're going to cover today. uh, Verse 24 of John 5. And Yeshua says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that, this is Yeshua speaking, He that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And so he starts it out with verily, verily. I learned something this week. And I've heard some of y'all mention something that I learned like with a question mark. So um, it, it should be interesting. So verily, verily, you look it up. The Greek word is amen, right? Amen. So it's amen, amen is what it would be in Greek. And um, at the begin, and this is used. This word in Greek is used throughout the scriptures at the beginning of things, like we see here. Verily, verily, amen, amen. It's also used at the end of scriptures, but it's not translated verily at the end of scriptures. But it's the same Greek word. And at the beginning, it means surely. Or surely let this be true, or let this be true. And, and as I've explained it to people before, verily, verily means, hey, y'all listen up, right? That what I'm about to say is important. And at the end, verily, verily, the word, the Greek word is amen, means so let it be. So this something was said that was important, and so let it be. Now, it's a transliterated word from Hebrew. So it's not translated, it's transliterated, meaning they took the Hebrew word amen and they just brought it into the Greek to mean the same thing. And what would happen at a synagogue when somebody would get up and offer a prayer in a synagogue, the congregation at the end of that prayer would all say amen, thus let it be so. Thus connecting themselves with that prayer. So it was like corporate prayer. When they said amen, amen, what they were saying was, let what this brother has, has prayed be so. That's my prayer also. We call it today, you know, in circles, agree. Won't you agree with me in prayer? You know, have you ever heard somebody say that? Let's agree in prayer. Um, I remember a little side story. I was at a conference for pandemic flu for clergy in Kansas City. So there's all these different people in there at a theological seminary thing. And this guy comes in, he's like one of the head priest pastors, I don't know what they call them, I don't want to get into the, who it was exactly, but he's a head dude, uh, preacher man, comes walking in, and I mean, I know I have a lot of room to talk not, but you know, he's kind of shabbily dressed, and he's got like Birkenstocks on and bare feet, and he comes like, and this is like a big dude, like there's all these pastors and 
and suits and they've brought their elders and you know you've got the the african-american churches that are all dressed really nice i sat next to this guy i've told this part of the story before this greek orthodox guy he was really cool people were afraid to sit next to him because he looked scary you know so there's all these different people which was kind of cool and this guy comes kind of sloughing up and he goes well, let's pray and so i'm like okay and i'm praying and i'm agreeing with him in prayer until he says <laughs> like in the first three seconds oh father who's also known by many names, Buddha and <laughs> Allah, and I'm like, I'm done. And, and I, I, open, I unbowed my head and I opened up my eyes and I'm looking around and this, this big, scary looking like Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox priest, he's just going, he's scowling. What is this? <laughs> so he was not agreeing with them in prayer. But the, the Hebrew word amen means let it be so. Um, and so the, the Greeks translate it into Hebrew. And so Yeshua begins um, what we call verse 24 here in John. Um, he begins it with verily, verily, truly, truly, let this be true, what I'm about to say. And if we think about that a couple different ways, one, Yeshua said elsewhere, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? He is the truth. And so everything, and we know this, Everything Yeshua said is true. So if everything he says is true, when he says, let this be true, that's like the truth of truth. You know what I mean? It's like everything that comes out of my mouth, I'm pretending I'm Yeshua now. Everything that comes out of my mouth is the truth. This is especially true. This is important. Y'all need to listen up. If I've been giving you truth before, here comes a very deep truth. And so when he says verily, verily, it's important and it's to add additional weight to what he's about to proclaim as if everything he already said was not important right <laughs> I mean, you know, but this is especially important and interesting side note yeshua says verily verily 25 times in this book it might be an interesting study to go look at everywhere he said verily verily <laughs> and pull those out because out of everything he said, 25 times he said, y'all listen up, this is real important, what I'm about to tell you. So that's how he starts this. Verily, verily. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word, and then the rest is, and believes on him that sent me. The, the word hear in Greek, right? Are you, are you all there? Mm -hmm. 524, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And so the Greek word here is akuo. It's important, not that it's akuo, but here's what it really means. Because see, we think, hey, I hear you. Yeah, hey, did you hear what I said? Yeah, I heard what you said. <gasps> I, I looked it up in Strong's. To be endowed with the faculty of hearing, not deaf. So that's like the way, right? Everybody there, full stops right there. If, if you hear his word, okay, well, if you hear Jesus' word, I heard it, heard what he said. That's not what it means. It also means to attend to, to consider what is or has been said, to understand, to perceive the sense of what is said, to perceive by the ear what is announced in one's presence, to get by hearing, learn, a thing that comes to one's ears to find out, to learn, to give ear to a teaching or teacher. He's master, right? So he's teaching, so to give ear to that, to comprehend, to understand. And so he that hears the word of Yeshua, which is what he's saying right now, is not merely perceiving the words that are coming out of his mouth. Like, wow, 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 wow. That's not what that means when he says, he that hears my word. It means they comprehend, they learn, they understand. Um, they take it on board. It's like, he says it, I got it. I'm going to grab that and, and internalize it because he's the master and I'm going to go do what he says. That's what he means when he says, he that hears my words. And so hearing the word is important. We read that all, th all through the word. And I just picked a couple examples. So Romans, you don't have to turn there. I'll just read it. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God or the word of Elohim. And so faith comes by what? Hearing. By hearing. And Yeshua says, he that hears my word. Um, go ahead. And, uh, well, one more. Because I talked, I made kind of like a sideways comment about the parable and the guy going back to the funeral and being surrounded by, by things that choke him out, perhaps. Um, Yeshua, when he tells that parable, 
about the sower ends it. Mark uh, 4, verse 9, he ends that parable by saying, He said unto them, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, obviously, Yeshua wasn't telling this parable to say, just make sure you heard what I said. He's saying, make sure you heard what I said. Make sure you take in what I said, understand what I said, and how it applies to you. Go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 8. We're going to spend a little bit of time. We'll come back to John. Mark 8, um, 14. So now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. There's all these people out there. And, and um, he charged them and saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. There's another whole sermon there. And they reason among themselves saying, I know why he said that. It's because we don't have any bread. And then here Yeshua gets a little frustrated again. And then Jesus knew it. He said unto them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Perceive ye not, neither do you understand. See, because what he said, they didn't really take on board. They didn't understand what he was saying in the true <coughs> sense of it. Have, your, have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not? Having ears, hear ye not? Do you not remember? Now, obviously, you can tell when he says, do you have eyes and you can't see? Do you have ears and you can't hear? Don't you remember? He's not talking about just the shallow example of seeing and hearing. He's talking about understanding. Don't you understand what I'm... What I'm don't you, aren't you picking up what I'm laying down? You know, that kind of thing. It's like you're not getting me, guys. And so uh, another leaning, uh, a learning point here is the question we ask ourselves, have you heard? Like, have you really heard? Obviously, none of us have physically heard the words of Yeshua. None of us have. But are we understanding what, we, what he said? Are we taking it on board? Are we internalizing um, what he said? He says, verily, verily. And so the question is, are you listening? Are you listening? Um, I said before, I said it a couple times, and I still haven't done it because I don't have that Bible, which is a very weak excuse. Um, but I would like to just do a personal study, all the words in red, right? All the words Yeshua said. I'm telling you, um, I just found this out about the 25 times that he says, verily, verily. I'm going to do that first. I'm going to go look at what he said, verily, verily, um, because I want to take that on board. I want to take on board everything he said, uh, but I think that's probably a good place to start. And so are you listening? All right, back to John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word, so we, we talked about hearing my word, and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And so the word believe in Greek I don't speak Greek, but I can sort of say it. Pistiuo, pistiuo. And I have a note here. It's used in the New Testament of the conviction and trust to which a man is impelled by a certain inner and higher prerogative of law and soul. Here's the deal. If you believe by the real definition of believe, you are impelled to act. If you, if you truly believe something, then your actions are going to show it. We know this. Right? But that's the sense of this word here. It's not the sense of the word that a lot of people take on board when they read this. They just go right there. If you hear my words and believe on him that sent me, okay, yeah, I got that. I, I, I have all that. But they don't. Are they impelled? And so I know this is well plowed ground with us again, but maybe some people out there need to hear about the difference between hearing and believing. It's so shallow in English. In our modern English, hear and believe. Yeah, well, I, I hear his words. I get what he means. I've read what he said in the Bible. And I believe that, that God's out there. You know, I, I believe in him that sent him. I got it. I'm, check those two blocks. I'm good to go. I have everlasting life. That's what people do. But they're not looking at the, 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 um, the depth of what it means, of what this meant to the people in the first century church who were hearing this. Because when they heard, hear my words, believe on him who sent me, they knew that that meant take on board what I'm saying, Yeshua, what Yeshua is saying, and believe, be impelled to action by Yah. If, if you have those two things, then you have everlasting life. And he says, um, this, is, you know, this is who has everlasting life, the people who do that. This is who shall not come into condemnation, and this is who is passed from death unto life. 
And again, I think we read over to that really fast. Nobody, he, he talked about earlier, we covered that last week about you know, having the power to, to raise the dead and, and Yeshua has that power. But people don't really think about being passed from death to life. It's like, what? We're dead in our sins before we come to Yeshua. We're, we're eternally dead. We're living, we're walking, we're talking, we're breathing, we're eating Big Macs or whatever, but we're dead until we come to Yeshua. And at that point, once we're saved, once we see the light, once we put our hand on the plow, we are now, we have eternal life, which is another concept that I guess I'm having a hard time grasping it because I keep bringing it up in, in sermons when, when it comes up. We're in our eternal life now. See, it's not like we die and then go to glory and, and go to our eternal life. You're living your eternal life now. You have the same soul in you right now that you're going to have forever. And so the experiences you're having now, you're taking with you. It's kind of something to think about. I've accepted Yeshua. I'm walking in the way. I'm in my eternal life. Now, I'm not in my eternal body, right? This flesh thing is going to go away, which start getting older like me and Sister Kate. You're kind of like, yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> but, <laughs> all right, um, well, I just got off track a little bit. All right, so. I get the impression, I think one could get the impression that when um, James, when James wrote his letter, he was picking up some of a, what was going on. And, and James says this, and, and you guys have, have heard this before, um, James chapter 2 starts in verse 17, but you've heard it before. Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Because, see, if you believe on him that sent me, which is what Yeshua says, believe on him means you have faith, right? It's, it's, it's the same thing. It's related. If you believe something, you have faith in that thing. If you believe on him that sent me, if you believe on Yahweh, then you have faith in Yahweh. And so then James, I think he was talking to people who took the belief like a lot of us take the belief. Yeah, well, I believe in God. I've, how many people here have heard that? Oh, I believe in God. And you're looking at him going, wow, yeah. Um, so this is the, the verse that I always go to. Even so, faith that has not works is dead, being alone. Yet a man says, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And, and here's what it is. You believe there's one God? You do well. The devils also believe, and they tremble. See, that's the kind of belief he's talking about. He's throwing their belief back at him. He's saying, oh, so you believe there's a God. You believe there's one God. Oh, isn't that nice? The devils believe that. The demons believe that. And they know. They've actually internalized that. They know, and that's why they're trembling. Because they know they're lost and, and they're in trouble. So faith, so-called faith, works without walking it out. It's no faith at all. And so a lot of um, maybe confused Christians out there, maybe confused Israelites, um, think that works in this stance, you know, faith without works is dead. Okay, so works is um, we're going we're gonna to take together a collection. We're going to go buy some groceries for that poor family. So we did a good work. Don't let the left hand know what the right hand's doing. We're just going to go feed that family and not take any credit for it. Or there's this old man in town and we're going to go shovel his sidewalk when it snows because he's too old to do it. Um, that's the guineas. We brought them with us. So, so you kind of feel like you're at Shofar Mountain. Um, there is nothing wrong with those works. In fact, I think Yeshua would be happy with someone who did feed the poor and take care of that old guy and you know, shovel his, his sidewalk or whatever because he can't do it. Um, but these are not the works that faith without works is dead. The faith without works that is dead, if you have faith in Yah, if you have faith in Yahweh, the Lord, you're going to do the things he told you to do. And those things he told us to do are clearly laid out in Torah. That's what we're supposed to do. He said, do these things. Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And, and again, I'm not, I'm not going to go there again because we, we always do that. Um, Yeshua said, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word, takes it in, and believes on him that sent me, actually walks out their faith and does what Yah said because they believe he is who he says he was. They have everlasting life. What's this everlasting life? What's the everlasting life? We know. Eternal life, right? It's eternal life. It doesn't mean you're going to live to be 4,000 years old, right? We're going to live eternally with the Father. 
and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> amen. All right. 